All right. Um, one moment. Okay. <laughs> okay, cool. Hi, everyone. Um, uh, sorry to keep you waiting for a few minutes here. We're, we're a little bit new to doing this ourselves, and um, I'm also traveling. Uh, I'm in Eastern Oregon today, so hello from Canyon City, Oregon. Apologies for the, the road noise in the background. Um, my name is Lynn Davis. I'm program co-director for Healthy Democracy, and... Hi everyone, Alex Ranieri, also program co-director with Healthy Democracy. Um, thanks so much for being with us for this exciting, sort of one of the first uh, kind of events in this Petaluma Fairgrounds advisory panel process uh, that we've just started in partnership with the city of Petaluma. Uh, Healthy Democracy, just as a little bit of background, is a nonpartisan nonprofit that designs and coordinates deliberative democracy programs. We're based in Oregon, although we've worked in five states and a, a couple other times in California, actually, and a couple other countries. We're all about bringing everyday people from all walks of life into political decision making. Um, we're coming to you live today to select the Informational Advisory Committee, a group of stakeholders who will support the Petaluma Fairgrounds Advisory Panel um, that we'll be referring to as the panel over the next couple of months. And Alex will talk more in a few minutes about sort of what the difference is between those two groups. Um, as a bit of background, on February 28th, the Petaluma City Council approved an innovative new process for involving the community in a conversation about the future of the fairgrounds. And we at Healthy Democracy are thrilled to be designing and coordinating that process. We're passionate about processes that empower groups as diverse as our communities to participate deeply in public decision-making. And um, our model we think is, is uh, fairly unique. Um, and if you're interested in learning more about it, uh, we'll add a link to our full presentation to city council back on the 28th to the description of this video once it becomes a recording on YouTube. So it may take a little bit uh, later on today, uh, March 24th um, for us to put it there. Uh, the link to the to the city council meeting and you'll you'll find sort of our presentation starting at the 50 minute mark five zero uh, so with that sort of mini introduction let me turn it back to alex uh, to talk about the informational advisory committee what we're selecting today uh, its role and its function in the process yeah so yeah, by way of a little bit more background, um, highly encourage folks to go look at our full presentation to council. And if you really wanna get into the nitty gritty of what this process is gonna look like, um, but there are these two distinct bodies that we're in the process of recruiting for right now, the panel as Lynn mentioned, and this informational advisory committee. So just wanted to back up and be clear about the difference between those two groups. The panel is the group of everyday folks who don't necessarily have a stake or know about the fairgrounds um, currently, um, who will come together for over 90 hours of meetings throughout May, June, and July of this year, and then deliver several recommendations to city council and the fair board. So if you're watching and tuned into this event because you received an invitation in the mail for that panel, um, please, feel free to stick with us, but also tune in again uh, on April 13th, when we'll be doing a much more fun and exciting and produced event uh, to select the panel itself. Um, so back to today, today we're running this just brief live stream to select the informational advisory committee, which is the group of stakeholders whose job it will be to gather and suggest information that will help the panel you know, learn everything it possibly can about the fairgrounds. Um, so to kind of help us visualize what that means, I'm gonna share just one slide from our presentation um, to city council. That's the, the diagram of players in this project. So you'll see at the center, the lottery selected panel, um, they're doing the deliberation. Um, they're kind of the star of this show. And stakeholders also have a really significant role. So stakeholders feed into the informational advisory committee over to the left side. 
And both of those groups um, provide input and important context for the panelists. So a little more specifically, stakeholders are involved throughout this project to curate information and also to act as presenters themselves. The IAC is a balanced stakeholder body that represents key interests within the community, selected by lottery from a pool of nominees, which you're about to watch. Um, and their role is to select initial presenters so folks who will speak to the panel on that first weekend and help provide some context of where we've been, you know, the current factors and the future of the fairgrounds. Um, and also develop a menu of all the folks panelists might want to call to talk to, to fill in any gaps in information um, after, after many hours of that informational information gathering phase at the beginning. Right. Um, let's see if I missed anything here. Oh, we just want to make sure to mention too that while the IAC, this group that's being selected right now, is really important to the process, there are tons of other opportunities for stakeholders to be involved. So if you are watching and you were one of the people who um, who raised their hand and, and is in the pool of nominees and you aren't selected, or if you didn't respond, um, there are plenty of opportunities to provide direct input to the panel throughout their deliberations, um, to speak to panelists as presenters that provide that context. So please, I hope no one comes away from this feeling like they have been excluded or are left out of the process because this is only the first of many opportunities. So. With that, let's talk a little bit about the selection process for this, um, this process, or for this committee. Um, so this committee is made up of 14 people, each representing a group of stakeholders who have, again, some interest in the past, present, or future of the fairgrounds. And um, while it would have been a lot easier to just handpick committee members, uh, we believe that hand selection by anyone, whether that's the city or us or really any other entity, um, just introduces more risk for bias, for kind of personal uh, influence over the process. So instead, we're using our favorite tool, uh, lottery selection, to pick a committee that's both random and representative of those many stakeholder voices from across Petaluma and beyond. Um, we started this process by asking city staff to list all the organizations that have an interest in this topic and then group them into categories. And they brought that list to city council, who made some small changes to the final categories and nominated groups in those categories. Um, and then we sent emails to all 140 organizations, inviting them to select a representative from their group. Um, and really encouraging the participation of BIPOC folks, so Black, Indigenous, people of color, and women, and folks of other gender identities. Um, now, let's select this random and representative committee. And we use a program that Lynn already talked about a little bit, and we'll go into a little bit more depth about now. Awesome. Thanks, Alex. Um, and let me know if my internet connection is unstable here. Um, but hopefully it, it holds on. So we use a program called Panelot, hilariously, uh, that creates a panel that is random, randomly selected, but also representative uh, of, a, of certain demographic targets in the course of that randomness. That may sound a little bit confusing, but that's why we're going to do it here in in public, um, just as as uh, you know, yeah, as you can at home actually, because it is an open source program um, that was developed by a group of researchers from Carnegie Mellon University in Pennsylvania, from Harvard University, and from Stanford. Um, and it's just become public actually in the last year. Uh, we had been using it previous to that, and before that, we had been doing this all by hand, which you'll quickly see was, I, I can't even believe we did that back in the day, uh, because not only is it, uh, it's not just a simple random selection, it's trying to match against these sort of targets on a bunch of different categories. And under each of those categories is a couple of different options. Um, for the actual 
lottery selected panel for the for the Petaluma Fairgrounds Advisory Panel when we do that selection on April 13th, we'll be doing the same thing or a version of it, but it'll be much more complicated. We'll be using seven different categories of demographic factors. And under each of those, there will be, for example, under age, there'll be a number of different sort of age ranges. So this is a much simplified version because we're only selecting 12 people today. Now, as Alex said, there are 14 people on the committee, um, but two of them uh, are already sort of have a place there, uh, a staff representative from the city and a staff representative from the fair. Um, and um, yeah, a little bit more about so how the how the software works, it um, it it goes through and looks for um, a, a bunch of different panels, combinations of different individuals that all fit those different targets. Um, and it has to do this a whole bunch of times, um, and then we'll be selecting one of those sort of panels at random. Um, for more on how that works, because that is very much the the Cliff Notes version of what is a complex system look on our YouTube channel under the discussions on democracy playlist for uh, a, a video that we produced last year describing in excruciating detail perhaps how this works and um, and also an interview with a couple of folks who helped design it we'll also put a link to that down in the description after we post this video um, or save it and Another note that, as I mentioned, you can do this at home. The software is freely available on the internet. Um, just go to panelot.org, P-A-N-E-L-O-T, and we'll put a link to that down in the description as well. Now, I think Alex is gonna share the, uh, the sort of sheet that we use. Oh, hold on, loud noise on the highway. Okay, <laughs> there we go. Uh, so this is where what we sort of prepared in advance in terms of the demographic targets. Now, in the first category here, you'll see um, stakeholder the stakeholder categories. As Alex mentioned, those were approved by council um, a few weeks ago, and we'll be selecting one person from each of those categories. So that acts like a demographic factor, but it's it's sort of it's not based on the census or anything like that. The second category there is for uh, gender. And that one we have based on the census, the latest census estimates from 2020. Um, and this document, by the way, will be publicly available after this um, as well. It may take us a couple days to get this on the website. Um, and down, there'll be footnotes down at the bottom sort of explaining where the, the sources for these uh, different numbers. Um, so we'll be selecting sort of based on those targets in that sort of third or right-hand column there. Um, and they have ranges, as you can see, um, to, give the, to give the software a little bit of wiggle room as it tries to create this panel that, that meets all these factors at the same time. Now, the third uh, sort of section here is race and ethnicity. And we have vastly simplified, oversimplified, <laughs> perhaps you might say, uh, what is a, obviously a very complex category um, some simplification is always necessary in order to do this sort of proportional representation, but in this case, it's it's very simplified because of the number of people. We're only selecting 12 folks, and so that means that it, uh, it wouldn't work to sort of use a more complex category with an, a bunch of different um, factors there. Um, so we've simplified it to BIPOC or white, uh, non-Hispanic, and those are based on the uh, the census, but actually based on the census demographics for the K-12 population in the city of Petaluma, which was our directive from city council to do that where possible um, as an equity lens. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think, unless I'm missing something, Alex, have I covered everything there? And I'm handing it back over to you again. Yeah, that's perfect. Awesome. <laughs> Alrighty. Um, so we've received 43 responses from uh, stakeholders who we reached out to who were nominated. And next I'm going to flip to what the spreadsheet looks like once we anonymized that information. So you'll see everybody who responded has a, an identifier over on the left hand column. Um, and then you'll see the three factors that, that Lynn just went over. So gender, race and ethnicity and stakeholder category associated with each person. 
And this is what we feed into the selection software. Now let's move over to Panelot. You'll see the program that Lynn just talked about. If you go to panelot.org, let's just show everybody. Um, very accessible, clean, ready to use, play around with. <laughs> we'll go up to compute a civic lottery. And we're choosing a file, which is essentially just exactly what Lynn shared, but simplified so that the program um, will run. Next, we're choosing the file that I just showed on screen, IAC respondents. It's confirming here, just in case we hadn't already anonymized everything, that we're not feeding any sensitive information into this uh, system. We input the number of panel participants we're looking for. This is 12, and as Lynn mentioned, there are 14 seats on this committee, and what council approved was that one of those seats is automatically filled by city staff, and one of those seats is automatically filled by uh, fair board or the fourth DAA staff. Um, so in the lottery pool are um, 12. I'm confirming that the anonymized table contains no personal information. And Lynn, do you want to do a drum roll? <laughs> <laughs> In progress. Oh. Uh, just as a note here, <laughs> well, while it's while it's waiting, um, I forgot to mention that they call it a civic lottery. We call it a democratic lottery. It's also this is also called sortition. Maybe I mentioned that before. I forget. It's called different things, but it's all the same the same idea. This is very interesting. When we did the trial run earlier. Um, the the server was not as busy i guess more people are <sighs> electing lotteries at this time of day <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're, For... <laughs> have a little tea and compute a civic lottery <laughs> right right if you're watching this later you may you may want to just skip ahead in the video <laughs> see where the actual thing happens we'll just hang out here yeah. uh, <laughs> but uh, i believe this uses university resources at one of those universities so it may be competing not just with people running lotteries but like math students doing doing computations and that kind of thing hello good morning <clears throat> welcome back to the informational advisory committee selection event part two for anyone who tuned in uh, yesterday evening, my colleague Lynn and I, Alex Ranieri, program co-director with Healthy Democracy, were selecting by lottery our members of the Informational Advisory Committee for the Petaluma Fairgrounds Advisory Panel process. And <clears throat> after giving you some background on the role of the stakeholder committee, um, we went to compute the lottery in real time, and unfortunately, the, the servers did not have bandwidth to compute the lottery. So we waited um, last night for it to compute, and now it is 9.53 a.m. on Friday morning of March 25th, and I am going to show you the rest of that lottery selection to be fully transparent about this process and finally announce the roster of our committee membership. So I will go ahead and share my screen again. So after working all night long, <laughs> um, here's what the software generated. Our civic lottery was successfully generated Here's the probability of selection for the members. I will download this link, uh, which is essentially a file with multiple potential panels. To show you what that looks like here on the screen, everybody again coded, um, fully anonymized. And now we're going to take this lottery file and select a single panel. Follow this link, 
we'll upload our lottery. And as you can see here, <clears throat> um, the lottery table is, is red. And the next step is to use this little random number generator to generate a totally random number that will tell us which of these many potential panels that fit that those uh, criteria for representation we talked about yesterday, um, we will get. So here's our number. <laughs> 958075. I'm copying that and pasting it below. And here we go, drawing the panel. And here is our committee. So I am going to reference our, um, our not anonymized sheet on my other screen here and um, announce on camera who, who our members are. Lynn was going to help me with this, so it might be a little bit a little bit uh, clunky here, but I want to make sure that we announce everybody in real time. So person 1001 is um, Arthur B. Cheney from 100 Black Men of Sonoma County. Person 1010 is Ann Edminster with Climate Action Petaluma. I should say uh, they're stakeholder groups as well. So 100 Black Men of Sonoma County is in that BIPOC LGBTQIA 2S plus groups category. And Edminster with Climate Action Petaluma is in our environmental and climate action groups category. Person 1063 is Catherine Lundy with Liberty School District representing the schools and education category. Person 1071 is Mark Scott with the North Bay Animal Services, representing our emergency services category. Person 1094 is Onita Pellegrini with the Petaluma Area Chamber of Commerce, representing business groups. Person 1120 is Anna Cordoba Bellic uh, with the Petaluma Family Resource Center at McDowell. Person 1148 is Kimberly Arts with the Petaluma High School Agricultural Department and Petaluma FFA representing our agricultural groups. Person 1161 is Jonathan Gainley with Petaluma National Little League representing families, youth, age-friendly and recreation groups. Person 1175 is Diana Spaulding with the Petaluma Regional Library representing property neighbors. Let me just get over to our last person here. Uh, person, or second to last, person 1190 is Shannon Kramer with Petaluma Valley Rotary representing nonprofit and faith based organizations. And finally, let me just get that over where I can see it. Oh, two more. Uh, person 1212, Jerry Wilkinson um, with uh, Petaluma Wheelman Cycling Group representing active transportation. And finally, person 1225, Hector Coelho, Coelho uh, with Play Dog Play representing current tenants and property users. So I'll mention again, first of all, congratulations to everybody serving on the Informational Advisory Committee. Um, it will be these 12 members plus uh, uh, someone representing the 4th District Agricultural Association and a staff member representing the city. Um, I'll be sending out scheduling emails today so that group can, can, can begin meeting very soon to begin to prepare for the fairground advisory panel process. And one last note, this is, as we mentioned yesterday, not the only opportunity for stakeholders to be involved. This group will be curating recommendations for who the panel should hear from. And that may include any of the 40 people who responded to the IAC um, nomination or the 140 who were nominated 
and beyond that, really the sky is the limit.